good morning. Sorry we're a little late getting started. Broke my tripod. Couldn't find my tablet. Yep, it's one of those Monday mornings. Yay! <laughs> Yay for Mondays. Alrighty, so we are on February 4th. It is Exodus 19 through 21. Um, hope you guys had an excellent... Uh, better. Hope you guys had an excellent weekend. Um, Let's see, what did we do this? Well, Super Bowl, obviously. And then um, just time with family and, and uh, relaxing and catching up and good stuff, right? So hope that you had a great weekend. Hope that you're ready to get started on this work week, ready to stay focused on the plan that God has for your life and um, the direction and purpose that he has for you. So let's go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care about us. Thank you that you want to hear from us. Lord, um, we want nothing more than to be right with you. We want nothing more than to be in your presence, Lord. We just ask that you'd fill this room with your presence. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Continue to speak to our hearts and our minds. Show us, guide us, and direct us. Help us to live out the purpose that you have for our lives. We just thank you and praise you for who and what you are and for who and where you've placed us and who you've placed us around and all the opportunities that you give us each and every day, Lord. I just pray that you would help us to grasp those opportunities in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Again, we're in Exodus uh, 19, and here we go. So verse 16, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Okay, what people? The Israelites. Um, where are they? They they are who what what are they doing they are uh leaving the desert they left egypt and they're following god into the desert they are being led by a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day um, moses and aaron are their leaders pretty much moses um who what where where are they they're in the desert they have been in the desert now for a while who, what, where, when, when is this? This is after um, all the 10 plagues happened in Egypt. Pharaoh and his army was covered by the Red Sea. Um, and they are now uh, following God in the desert. And who, what, where, when, why, why are they doing this? Because they were crying out to God and God heard their cry and God is their God and he is faithful to keep his promises and he promised Abraham Isaac and Jacob that they would be a great nation and this is the great nation that God made them and God is bringing them out of Egypt so here we go on the morning of the third day there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud, loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God they took their stand at the foot of the mountain now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it with fire. Okay, um, we don't have that nowadays. That is not the normal way God speaks to or meets us. Um, we meet the Lord here in his word. Um, when we ask uh, Jesus Christ into our life and we have a personal relationship with him, we we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So God doesn't descend on mountains with fire anymore because his presence lives within us. So the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. When God calls to you, you go, right? Um, we don't have this visible manifestation of God usually anymore um, because we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was the promise that Jesus made to us that he was going to send when he returned to his father. So the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to the Lord. Uh, lest they break through to the Lord to look and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves. Let's see. Hold 
writing is very small. That might be, no, nope, it's still small. Okay, consecrate themselves. Um, there, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. I'm having a hard time reading, had to use a different tablet. Um, for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Okay. The people couldn't be in the presence of God because then God would, they would die. So God is getting ready to give them the commandments that they need in order to know, so they would know what he expected of them. The Ten Commandments were never meant for us to be able to keep completely and then be right with God because you can't be perfect. And so the Ten Commandments are actually meant for us to see that we can't keep the Ten Commandments. And by not keeping the Ten Commandments, it shows us our need for a Savior. And it points us to Jesus Christ. So the Ten Commandments, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now the footnote on that says, besides me. You shall have no other gods besides me. When we put anything more important than God, it becomes an idol in our lives. And therefore God will have to remove it from our lives. And that's not pleasant and it's not a good place to be, right? You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing fat, steadfast love to the thousands. And the footnote on that one says, to the thousandth generation, to the thousandth generation of those who love and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, the sojourner in your gates. Wow, no work. We were never meant to work seven days a week, okay? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. If God gave us the pattern to work six and rest one, then that's what we should be doing, right? Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. And the footnote says, the Hebrew word also covers causing human death through carelessness or negligence. So even careless or negligent death is not to be done. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's, neighbor's house. You shall not cover your, covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, anything that is your neighbor's, his RV, his house, his kids' education, his kids, anything. You shouldn't be coveting what other people have. You should be grateful for what you have, right? Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and the footnote on that says in Samaritan and the Septuagint in the Syriac and the Vulgate the Masoretic text says the people saw so the people saw and trembled they stood far off and said to Moses you speak to us and we will listen but do not let God speak to us lest we die Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. And the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. They had fear of who and what God was. Why? Because they didn't have the relationship with God that Moses had. When you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you have 
no fear. There's no fear in God. God God is not fear. Perfect love casts out fear, and God is love. So laws about altars. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and sacrifice on it burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it in hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. So God is giving them how he wants them to worship him. And you can't do a good thing the wrong way and think you're going to be blessed by it. So that's why he's letting them know exactly what he wants from them. Laws about slaves. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh year, he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. That would mean that the the slave would want to stay with the master, and that would be a sign that he was voluntarily becoming the, the master's servant, and he's wanting to stay with his family that was still slaves. So when you give yourself to the master, that was a symbol of that. So when a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who was designated, who has designated her, and the footnote says, so that he has not designated her. So let's see. Um, when a man sells his daughter a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. And who ha so that he has not designated her so that he has not designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as his, with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money." because women were property and they were not considered able to make those decisions for themselves. It wasn't until Jesus Christ came and gave women the worth that they see today that all that changed. Um, Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death, but if he did not lie in wait for him, but if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint you for a you I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee, and that was um, cities of refuge. But if a man willfully attacks another man to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. So cities of refuge were set up for those that unwilling, unknowingly, or just by happenstance killed somebody. And so they could go to a city of refuge. So the family of the one that died wouldn't kill them. So whoever strikes his father and mother shall be put to death. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. And whoever curses his father and the footnote there says dishonors or reviles his father um, or mother shall be put to death. When a man quarrel, when men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist and the man does not die but takes to his bed, then if the man rises again and walks outdoors with his staff, he who struck him shall be clear. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him thoroughly healed. So you beat somebody up, he can't work. 
you got to pay for him to be healed and pay him his lost wages because now he can't work because you beat him up. Yeah, there were rules for everything. When a, man, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. So, God is condemning human trafficking and slavery. What kind of a loving God is that? Again, this is a different time, a different culture. This is not, this is not now. Okay, but during this time and during this culture, these rules were set up and actually gave slaves and women more rights than they had previously, if you can believe that. So God is the God of mercy and justice and fairness, and that's why these rules were set in place. So now we go into Matthew 23, 13 through 39. So, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, who's saying this? Jesus. Jesus is saying this. Who, what, what is he saying? He's, he's putting down the teachers of the law, which are the scribes and the Pharisees, the ones that would teach all of these rules to the people. Um, and he's got pretty good reason. Why? Let's see. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. And the footnote there says... Um, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Jesus is calling out the teachers of the law because instead of helping the people follow the rules of God, they were using the rules of God to keep the people under their thumb and, and make them unable to reach God because there was no way they could ever uh, fulfill all of the rules and laws or even um, receive the offerings or, or, or offer sacrifices that were worthy enough to be able to rectify that with God. So they were never right with God. And it was because the scribes and Pharisees were so harsh. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and make across sea and land to make a single proselyte and when he becomes a proselyte you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves and the footnote there says Gehenna so another word for hell is Gehenna as much a child of Gehenna as yourselves a proselyte let's see if I can look it up a proselyte is a person who has converted from one opinion religion or party to another so they would cross land and sea and they would go to these foreign places and they would make um, religious people that had no religion. Yet they didn't because they would share what God is and what he does and what they needed to do. And then they would make it so difficult that they could never do it. And so they're they're worse off than they were before so woe to you blind guides who say if anyone swears by the temple it is nothing but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple he is bound by his oath you blind fools for which is greater the gold or the temple that he has made the gold sacred and you say if anyone swears by the altar it is nothing but if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar he is bound by his oath you blind men. This is Jesus talking to these, rule, these, these teachers of the law and rulers of the people. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? For whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. Who dwells in it? Jeez, God. God dwells in it, right? And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Okay, so he said it once in 16. Um, once in 17, you blind guides, you blind fools. Um, 18, 19, you blind men. Um, and now we're in 23. Woe to you, hypocrites. He is 
Not just saying it once, he's saying it several times. Why? Because it's that important. When God says it once, there you go. When God says it twice, pay attention. When God says it three times or more, he's extremely serious. And here we are. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. They were so concerned about mint and dill and cumin, which are small little seasonings, right? Tithes of those things. Yet they did not give mercy or justice or faithfulness. It would be like eating a gnat, which is a tiny little fly, or getting the gnat out of something, but then eating a camel. I mean, it's ridiculous. So woe to you again, he says it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. What cup and plate is he talking about? Themselves. They cleaned the outside of themselves. They made themselves look like they were great. But inside, they were full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First, clean the inside of the cup and plate that the outside may be clean. You can't clean the outside of the pan and leave the inside of the pan filthy. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how clean the outside of the pan is if the inside is filthy, right? Um, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He's still going on. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. He's still going on. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would have not taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Yeah, you would. You're, you're killing the Messiah now, right? Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of you, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that you may, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of the innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah. And the footnote on that says, um, some manuscripts omit the son of Berechiah, so we either have it or we don't, um, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't, um, his word doesn't fall short. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And now he's lamenting over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When is that? That is at the end time. In the book of Revelation, we see that in the end times, people will see, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and everyone will understand that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and they will they will either kneel as him being their Lord and Savior, or they will kneel as him being their judge. But every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And everyone will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You want to be on the right side of that, right? Okay, so now we're in Psalms 28. The Lord is my strength and my shield. And this is a Psalm of David. So to you, O Lord, I call my rock, be not deaf to me. Lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Uh, hear the voice of my pleas for mercy. Oh, I was, oh, there it is, 639. Hear my, 
hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. When I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary, and the footnote on that says, your innermost sanctuary. When I lift up my hands toward your innermost sanctuary, do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. And again, this is this is reflective of the Pharisees, the scribes who were whitewashed walls, who were clean on the outside, but evil on the inside. Um, give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the work of his hands. He will tear them down and build them up no more. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. And I am helped, my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. The Lord is our strength. The Lord is our refuge. The Lord is our peace. The Lord is our mercy. He is our shield. He is our help. We are, he is worthy of our thanks and praise. He hears us when we call. He hears our pleas for mercy. He is with us. He protects us. He guides us. And he gives us reward according to the work of our hands. He knows our hearts, right? Um, our last reading for today is Proverbs 7, 1 through 5, a court warning against the adulteress. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep and keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend. To keep you from the forbidden woman. And the footnote on that says the strange woman. From the adulteress with her smooth words. Or from the foreign woman with her smooth words. It's not so much a woman that, I mean, obviously we shouldn't be lured into adultery, but it's being led away to follow after other gods. When we prostitute ourselves and, and follow the adulteress, you're falling away from your relationship with God and following after other gods by making other things more important than God. So the adulteress is not just a sexual, you know, the woman that's causing the man to leave the marriage type thing or the man that's causing the woman to leave the marriage. It's not all about that. It's about your heart not being faithful to God and your heart falling away from God and following other things. That's the adulteress. Anything that causes you to leave your number one relationship, which is with which is with God. So the adulteress is not always a person. The adulteress is things, people, places, um, thoughts, ourselves. Anything that causes us to or puts it's or we put more important than God becomes an adulteress in our life. So check yourself. Do you have an adulterous relationship in your life because you value someone or something more than your relationship with God? That's what's important. Your relationship with God is more important than anything, right? So thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me and, and uh, letting me share with you. I hope that um, it blessed you. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow early. We have travel tomorrow. Lots of things going on. Um, placing placing candidates, getting new candidates, hopefully. And um, God opening doors for new and exciting things. So we are blessed to be able to be here with you today. And we hope that uh, you are blessed and uh, if you have any prayer requests please like please share and please always um, let me know what's going on and I, I will answer so thanks so much God bless